Kia ora. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another exciting webinar here on Conscious Collective Page. I hope everyone is um, able to tune in and doing well. Um, for the first time this morning, we are streaming on YouTube as well. So hopefully the technology works. Um, we will see. But as always, we're just going to give a couple of minutes for everyone to tune in and um, and populate our feed. But Helen, it's so great to have you on the broadcast this morning. I'm very excited to talk to you about all sorts of things um, around our practice, infant toddlers, and our own emotional intelligence. Um, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Thank you for asking me. It's exciting to be here. How was your weekend? Uh, you know, all the days are sort of blurring together at the moment. So. <laughs> I think the same thing. A weekend as such, um, try not to have sort of rules around which days mean which at the moment, but it was good. Yeah, That's enjoying good. Yeah. the last of this beautiful weather, I think. I know, it's been beautiful sunshine. Yeah, we've had, it's been a, it's been a, just another few days, really, the weekend, and it's been good. I, uh, my parents live next door, but they're not in our bubble. So we kind of had a, dad's still working, he's, he's a doctor, and so, um, we kind of had like a across the fence barbecue at yeah. some human contact. It was nice. And um, yeah. my partner Maria and I are busy filming something called uh, how, how to Begin to Remember, which is an introduction to self awareness. I've just, we found um, that in a lot of this chat that we've had, the theme has come across of like we have to teach who we are. And, um, and really about that heart-centered approach, but also realizing that, man, a lot of us don't actually have a, have a clue of, or have been taught or shown how to even to begin to start that. So we're filming a little uh, workshop that we're gonna give um, free to everybody who uh, wants to register. Um, I think we're gonna do it through the online campaign, uh, online learning platform. So we've been busy filming that and that's hilarious because it's hard. It's hard to actually get stuff right. And there's so many bloopers, but it's fun. And then um, we've been doing some cool stuff. Uh, last week we mentioned that we started something called Aroha Collective, uh, which is yeah. just ki Kiwi supporting Kiwis, just trying out this platform. And I've just seen some awesome uh, ways of people showing up. Like it fills my heart that there are pe so many people wanting to be of service. So it's been good. It's been a really good few days. Um, and I'm I'm enjoying it for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm so. really blessed to be. I live rural, so there's always something that needs to be done around the property, and um, we've got we've got space. And um, I don't think I've ever really realised just what a gift that actually is uh, until yeah. this time. Moment, yeah. Yeah, totally. My heart does go out to people who are living in apartments or or small small blocks in this time it must be really difficult for sure right well we're gonna get started this morning it's great to see so many people tuned into this broadcast broadcast is that even the word that we use i think so <laughs> um so last week we had some of my favorite people that i admire so much in our industry in our sector sorry that spoke from their hearts and really gave us messages that that resonated for this time. And um, I know that you uh, viewed some of those broadcasts. What were some of the highlights for you? What has stood out for you? Yeah, so I actually, I watched all of the broadcasts and it's interesting to me, I think um, everybody that you spoke with this week has a, I guess a similar foundation to myself. And so it was really encouraging to hear this alignment throughout that you know we are we, we're pushing towards the same the same future the same goal and we all bring our own um strength and gifts to to what we're doing uh, but with a united vision so you know i took a lot away about um taking the time to be a little bit introspective at the moment um, look at where I'm at and what I'm doing, um, some 
some great tips, um, particularly actually from, from Tanya for me at the moment in terms of really accountability and not, um, not shifting blame, but also being kind to yourself and that kind of thing. Um, and then really, I suppose, just with Kimberly's session, the idea of, of those rituals and rhythms that we create for children and with children being a fuel source, um, which really aligns with a lot of what I teach as well. So, yeah. We are so um, fortunate. We're so fortunate to have these incredible voices of um, or advocates in our industry uh, here in New Zealand. Like the depth of the message that's coming across, the connectivity to our hearts and to children is remarkable. And to have this opportunity um, where we're, we're gathering together and all listening to this, I think I have a feeling in my heart that this is this could really shift some of our thoughts as we move back into our um, our learning centers when this is done. Yeah, definitely. I I was listening to um, Brene Brown's new podcast um, while I was out pottering around outside, and something that really struck me was was the idea that we've we've essentially said goodbye to what we knew, and we're stepping into this brand new space. And Penny talked about leaning in um, quite a bit and I, I thought that that was a, a really powerful message. I talk about it as, as pressing in so a similar concept or same concept in that you know that's scary, the unknown is scary and we like to stay where we are because even if it's not great it's, it's our comfort zone and so we're being asked at the moment to embrace something new and unknown um, so how can we lean into that um, and move forward from it. Very, very good. Yeah. So you, uh, you're an infant and toddler specialist. You work with a lot of teams around um, children zero to three, and I'm sure older as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm really interested to know, like, how did you, how did you come to be where you are now, and why is this so important for you? Yeah. So I mean, I've been in practice for near twelve years. Um, I started out just a, a baby, really, and um, kind of stumbled into it, I guess. Then throughout my training and my early experience on the floor, I started noticing the gaps between what I was being taught, what I was learning in my, in my qualification, and what I was sort of studying in my own um, interest in terms of the importance of this age group and the formation I was getting as a teacher. And so as I kind of went forward through that, I realized that if this age group is as important as what all the research says it is, why is this sort of the, the most quickly skimmed over age group in my whole degree right now? And, you know, I, why is it at that point in time that I would jump on kind of Trade Me or the Ed Gazette or, or whatever platform and look at positions available just out of interest and see that this was still an age group where the sector was advertising for untrained, unqualified educators. Um, and it was sort of perpetuating the notion for me that um, that is out there that, that caring and educating this age group is glorified babysitting. Uh, which didn't match up with what I knew to be true about what's happening at this age. So I embarked on um, my my additional training and research and study that I've done both with with Rye and with Pickler, uh, which has been a journey for the last ten years or so and still continues now. Uh, and the more I began to learn, the more I realised if I'm hungry for this knowledge and this information and this depth then there's got to be other educators out there and parents and families in that same space. And so how can I share what it is that I've been so fortunate to dig deeper into with the people that are out there doing the work that's so important? Um, I think you make, you make a really good point that I think we just need to pause and and understand is that often when we come out of our training, even as qualified early childhood teachers, it seems that depending on which institution you went to, the how-tos and the theory behind infant toddler practices are limited 
and um, we we just need to pause and be okay with that, like understand that, and um, realize the 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 gap in our knowledge, and that it's okay, but that we have an opportunity to actually learn, and and look towards people like yourself and Penny and Kimberly as to what good actually looks like. Mm -hmm. And I think for me that the the realization quite early on that we really did, we didn't have a lot to go on in terms of what 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 does good look like? What is quality? When we talk about quality for infants and toddlers, what does that actually mean? And this in the in the grand scheme of how we've been bringing up children for throughout history, this group um, group here situation is is relatively new, and so who can we look to and where can we look to for guidance on how to do that in a way that not only doesn't break the children but that actually has them thrive i think survival is a very a very poor goal um let's let's work towards having the children thrive because they're in our environment survival is a poor goal i like that because <laughs> just gonna turn up and just get through this day there's, there's a misalignment and um, we're gonna delve deeper into how infant and toddler teams can work together and create um, cohesion and what that practice looks like. But I, I have a question for you and we have many parents who'd be watching as well and who this video would be shared with. Um, right now, uh, things have grinded to a halt and for many parents, this would be the longest period that they're probably spending with their baby. Um, in you know in kind of like recent history so um it could be quite new and it could be quite daunting and and i want to um, ensure that there is a, a non-judgment and kindness that that un understands that kind of situation we're in but what would you um how would you kind of give guidance to parents who are in that in this space right now mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, you hit the nail on the head when you say that this is, we, we sort of had this this shock factor thrown at us. And for a lot of parents and families, not just the ones whose, whose children were previously um, in, in a centre, but, but the ones who have had really involved family members, who have had a village tightly knit around them for for a long time and have suddenly lost the, the physical reality of that. Um, we're faced with things that we probably haven't needed to be faced with in quite a while. And you touched on this um, throughout last week, Rick, when you said we're confronted with some stuff that we probably have been too busy to confront for a while. And so we kind of spend our time in busyness getting through the day. And here we are faced with some really tough stuff. And I see a lot out there at the moment about how this is a time for slowness and rest. And, you know, for, it, for some of us it is, but for a lot of us, especially people with young children, this is hard, really hard. And I think, you know, messages out there around um, what you should be doing to keep your child engaged and busy and entertained are well intended but a little misplaced at times because I what I see is a lot of parents who feel the need to be on Pinterest and creating all these craft and sensory experiences and I don't fully believe that that's necessary I don't think our children are going to look back on this time and remember those things but what they will remember will be how we were with them um, how we responded to their crisis as well you know for our children a lot of the time their experience of going to to the center every day or going to school every day or going to grandma's three times a week that's a loss that they're experiencing and so for us we might not see that as such a big deal but for them that's enormous that's the biggest loss they may have ever experienced and so i think for me, it's it's how can we show up to that in a place that is seeking to understand, that is uh, seeking to hold space for those feelings and be a safe place for them um, and not feeling this pressure to entertain and keep your child busy all the time. That I see that as almost like a bit of a treadmill uh, because once you start that, then the child is always going to look to you for the source of the entertainment, the, um, the fun, the play. 
and so I the, the the main thing I would encourage parents to to try and do is to slow down in the day to day and the things that we we have to do anyway, and we're going to talk about that shortly when we when we focus on caregiving. Um, how can you be fully present in this moment while you give your child their lunch or while you change their nappy before you put them to bed? And, and then instead of having to construct quality time later on, you've had the quality time during the moments that have to occur anyway. Uh, and that the, those things in the end, I think, will be the most meaningful experiences for our children. I, I'm thinking of parents who you said that there's so much pressure, that we put so much pressure on ourselves, right? We, we're in an information overload uh, age where um, well-meaning specialists and good writers put out information and uh, of what, what good looks like, or shall we say what perfection in the ideal world looks like. And then we compare ourselves as parents to what we're seeing coming at us. And that can be extremely exhausting for many of us. And it can almost lead us to become um, somewhat paralyzed in our parenting. And we completely withdraw because we just don't think that we can be good enough. So um, what do you think if someone is in that overwhelmed category, like <laughs> pulling their hair, hairs out and, and have almost like started to disengage because it's just too hard, what is one thing that that they can do to just start reconnecting with um, their infant or toddler? Mm -hmm. So I think something that's really important at the moment for everybody, and particularly for parents, is the idea of mindful self-compassion. So we have a tendency to be our own worst critic, especially when it comes to the mistakes we make with our children. So for example, you know, I talk to a lot of parents who are crippled by guilt with, with how they're responding and, and the mistakes that they're making. And so I would say exercise some, some self-compassion. You know, we have a default tendency to think, oh, I'm, I'm such a crap mum, I lost it, and I, I was impatient in that moment. And how about if we if we were able to reframe that and go, okay, there was that response again, not ideal, but I feel like I'm, I was triggered by the, the pitch or the tone of that scream. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a, a quote that um, I actually have on my desktop at the moment, um, Rick, from Viktor Frankl, who you quoted the other day as well. Uh, and he says... Um, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our ability to, to choose our response. Um, and it is in that space that we'll find, in, in our response, that we'll find our, our freedom, essentially. And I might have got that slightly wrong. Yeah. And so what I think is important is that we give ourselves time. So when my child is having, you know, for want of maybe a better word, a tantrum, but we all understand what that means. Um, and I'm triggered by that. And my tendency is to have zero patience or tolerance for that. Can I step back for a minute? Can I take a breath? Can I relax my jaw? Can I see for a second, you know, maybe this isn't about me. Uh, it's not personal. Um, and then, then choose my response. And I'm, I'm not saying that that's an easy thing by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but rather than kind of this default tendency to think, oh, man, I yelled and I messed it up again, um, to allow ourselves a pause in, in our response rather than being reactive from this default setting. How can I just slow down enough that I, even if it means, and I say to parents, walk down the hallway, close the door for a minute, tell the child, I just need to to move away for a minute to gather myself and and then come back ready to actually be present and hold that space. And the other beautiful thing about relationship, um, and, and Magda said this herself, she said a good enough parent is good enough. <laughs> um, we have a grace um, space as parents that we're in this unconditional love-based relationship. And so my good enough will be good enough for my child and I was speaking to a friend just last night and he said something that really really struck me for this time he said Helen even the strongest relationships have 
fractures in attunement. Uh, and the gift is that what normally happens in repair is we are led to greater intimacy. So with our child, we have this ability, and in any relationship, to come and say, you know, I really didn't deal with that very well, and I know that that didn't feel good for you, and I'm sorry. And the beauty of this is that the result is usually a stronger bond and a stronger connection because we're, we're operating from integrity and authenticity. Absolutely. Um, I found with, with my relationship with my, my children, uh, we have four here that lives with us, absolutely a joyful house <laughs> most of the time. And yeah. um, I have found that the moments where I can suck up my pride <laughs> and mm -hmm. talk to um, my daughter or my son and say, hey, uh, I may have not gotten that quite right, <laughs> the way that my response was there. And um, I want you to know that um, I, I am aware of that and I apologize for the way that that, that ha was handled, that the strength and the intimacy that comes from the repair creates mm -hmm. such a deep connection for the, for the movement forward. And um, it's like the tearing of muscles to build them. Um, we should never be scared of the fractures, right? Because they provide the opportunities for strengthening. And I think that's a really great um, mind frame to have um, with our relationships, with, our, with any relationship that yeah. um, we should, I think, I think, okay, just hang on here with me one second. I think that the, the, the fractures in our relationships are, um, Possibly uh, we get so scared of them because we have this fear of abandonment or the fear of failure that like kicks into overdrive. So as soon as there's a conflict, maybe it's between um, a, a parent or it's even our, our teammates or any kind of rupture that we have in a relationship, our storyteller in our head kicks in and it's like, they don't, I'm not good enough. They're gonna leave me. Uh, this is gonna lead to a disaster. And so we're actually so scared of fractures. And so we um, kind of avoid them and we distance ourselves from it instead of seeing it as an opportunity of, uh, or not just reframing it as, as normal, like what you just said, that it's ev even the strongest relationships are gonna have fractures. And wow, these fractures or these conflicts are actually opportunities that when we show up with humility and authenticity and truth and love, that can actually strengthen our relationships rather than hurt them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think no matter the age of the child, this is relevant. You know, you have, you're going to have a more in-depth conversation with a child who's sort of five, six, ten years old. With an infant, right, I, I pick you up and I handle you in a way that is less than respectful or less than slow and peaceful. Um, and what that repair looks like is me saying, wow, I, I was, you know, so focused on changing your nappy that I, I picked you up in a hurry that kind of felt good for your body. I'll slow down now. And, you know, we have to trust that our babies have the capacity to, to understand that. Um, and a lot of that's purely going to come to our, down to our tone and our, our body language um, throughout those, those early experiences of that. But over time, what happens is we develop this relationship that's built on that on that place of integrity and authenticity. That I'm not, you know, when we aim for perfection, we're operating out of fear because I'm so afraid I won't be a good enough parent. I'm so afraid I won't be a good enough teacher. Um, I'm so afraid I'm going to screw up my my child. That's the most common thing, Rick, that parents say to me. Mm, I'm so afraid I'm going to screw my kid up. Um, stop being afraid <laughs> because, you know, this, this perfection mindset gets us nowhere. Um, we can't grow when we're in that space because we're so afraid to get it wrong. Um, it's in the acknowledgement it's, of the getting it wrong. That I'm, I'm so afraid that I'm going to screw up my child, right? Mm -hmm. um, innately, we then put so much power in ourselves and we diminish the power and the innate agency of the child. Like yes. to think that you have a lot of power to, to screw up your child in some way is true. We understand the nurture and the nature and how important that is. And however, we've seen the resiliency and the elasticity of that band and that connection between parent and child, right? I mean, the amount of stories that you hear of children who uh, were not 
treated well, like really not treated well, but there was an elasticity so that there could be a, a um, reconciliation of that relationship. So for so many parents, like I love what you say, doing your best is good enough. And um, one of my favorite spiritual teachers is a guy called uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, and he wrote a thing called Four Agree the Four Agreements, kind of like the agreements for, for, for experiencing awakening. And the fourth agreement is super simple, and it's just like, do your best. Yeah. And it's, it's purely that simplicity of do your best. Have you done your best? Are you showing up? Well, some days you'll be like, no, I didn't. Cool, tomorrow is another day. I'm just going to do my best. Don't have to go for perfection. Don't have to go for uh, being the the mum blogger that's gonna bake yeah. and go outside to nature and create these incredible things, right? Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about respectful um, practices for infants and toddlers. And I think um, uh, the the word respect sometimes gets thrown around a little bit. And, and I was saying to you before. The broadcast that um, it almost feels like every center or every infant toddler team now has respect or respectful practice as one of their core values. Um, and I wonder if sometimes we've lost the essence of what that actually means. So let's just st stay here for a second and think about and talk to me about what respectful practices for our Tamariki actually look like for you. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for me, I'm really big on going back to what the actual meaning of a word is. And I think a lot of us have a, a differing sense of, of what respect is because of our own uh, life experiences, our own upbringing, maybe for you, maybe respect was something that you had for someone who was bigger and scarier than, and more powerful than you. And so now how does that look in practice and so um you know those who have heard me speak before will know this um with their eyes closed but i go back to the the root of the word and, and in the english um word we'll find the, the original latin foundation and it's made up of, of two words or two sounds the first being re and the second being speak so when we when we kind of pull that apart what we find is that the word is taking another look so, you know, in order to have respect for you, I must see you in a new way. And so I, I now step into this place where I hold you in this high regard as somebody who um, I can have a great influence over, someone who can have a great influence over me. I begin to see you as um, a free and equal human being that I'm in relationship with. So now there's no place or space for you to be the child and me to be the adult and for there to be this kind of power and balance there. Um, you know, and I think that it's so important that that is our foundation and that it's not just a, it is, it is a buzzword. It has become a buzzword. And I'm hard pressed to, to come across a center who doesn't incorporate that word in their philosophy or their um, curriculum statement. But what I do see in practice is um, not quite the perfect marriage of what we say and what we do. And that's because it's hard. It's really hard to operate from a place of deep respect for the other because what it means is I will always be looking for the good of the other. I won't be, you know, and I think it's an important distinction to make as well between operating out of, of love and kindness, which are very important things. But what I notice is when we only come from that place, it's easy to, th these are very personally uh, subjective things, right? So if I love a baby, well, I have affection for the baby. And so I can grab the baby and I can pull the baby in and, and impart some, some infection because I love them. But could I do that in the name of true respect for the other person? And the answer is no. I can invite you know, for them to come and have a cuddle. But if I have a deep respect, I will, I will um, hear their response, whatever it might be, and I will, um, I will not push any further, and I will not do anything that is not in, in alignment with what your response tells me. Um, and you know, Magda said that in this world, a lot of terrible things have been done in the name of love, but nothing truly terrible could ever be done in the name of of true respect for the other person um so i think maybe 
I'm not saying love and kindness aren't important at all, but but they must be anchored in respect. Otherwise, they can be a bit disordered. I think that's um that's an incredible way of putting it. Putting that together, anchoring love and um, kindness with respect. And uh, what what does good respectful um, practices look like in our settings? Mm-hmm. I think to to kind of break it down, and it's a it's a lengthy conversation. I feel like we could it have really probably up, you know, but um, it would be thinking very carefully about my 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 handling of the child. Firstly, uh, the hands are the infant's first uh, experience with the world, and so how I receive touch, how I receive. Uh, physical contact, uh, language, um, human to human interaction is my earliest, uh, is forming my earliest idea and concept of, of what this world looks like and how I, how I fit in there. So thinking first of all about how I, how I handle the child, which comes essentially from how I am with myself, because if I am, if I'm operating from this place of, of slowness and of mindfulness, then you know the only energy that would transfer from me to the child would be calmness, slowness, mindfulness. Um, and I think hand in hand with that is going to come naturally as a flow on how we speak to the child. That we would never do something to the child, but we will aim to do things with them. So we talk to them about everything that's going to happen. I see this a lot where we talk as we're doing things or in retrospect, you know, so I'm going to pick you up now as I'm already doing it. And, you know, so here we go back again to this idea that I'm going to keep on touching on of slowness. When I slow down just enough and I give you a moment, I'm going to pick you up now. And I'm not asking for your permission, but I'm asking, I'm inviting you to participate here. And with a very little baby, that's going to look like maybe a little shift in in the muscles. Maybe it's going to look like a little ch- change in, in glance. For an older child, it can be uh, arms up or it can be, no, <laughs> buzz off, I'm busy. Um, but that we are always kind of, um, our, our communication is always one step ahead of our action. Um so I guess that for me, those kind of three things, that the slowness, the, the touch, and the communication would be um, the fundamentals there. And we can obviously go a lot deeper into right. all of that. That would be the basics for me. So Kimberly talked about rhythms and rituals. And um, we had a few questions around, well, what does this actually look like with infants and toddlers? What do rhythms and rituals actually look like? Yeah. I think it's really important to to make the distinction between what this looks like for an older child who might not be receiving the same kind of um, hands-on care as a young younger child, a toddler or a baby. Um, care is a, a basic human need, but how we experience the care is sending very strong messages. This is the care we receive as an infant and a toddler and a young child is basically being wired into biochemistry of the brain. So it is our love, connection, respect for the child made flesh, basically. So what we have with the infant or the toddler is this beautiful opportunity presented to us in the care. And when I when I talk about the care or the care situation, I'm referring to anything we, we we're going to do caring for the child. So the hand washing, the face wiping, the nappy change, the preparing for sleep. And, you know, those things can often be seen, I guess, as maybe mundane. (laughs) Um, But with the child, especially in a group care context, this is often the only one-on-one, face-to-face, fully connected time they're going to have. So, you know, as an example, I can wash your face after a meal and I can sort of come at you with the final and just kind of go to wipe your face and we can we can put ourselves there and imagine what that feels like or i can i can put some some love in, into this i can prepare this little bowl of flannels maybe with you or with a couple of toddlers i can have them be warm i can have them maybe with a few drops of lavender oil or something and i can approach you 
and say, it looks like you have a little bit of, of yogurt still here on your upper lip. I, I'd like to help you to wipe that away. Now, the difference between those two scenarios is not drastic time-wise because that's always the thing I hear is, oh, you know, Helen, we don't have time. We've got 40,000 babies and it's fine for you. You've only got, you know, four. Um, my belief is that if we value it, we'll find the time for it, right? And and the other thing I say is you don't have time not to because have you ever tried to do something with a toddler who's not on your team? <laughs> it's <laughs> not a process, right? You've got this child who really doesn't want to have their face wiped Whereas if your experience in the memory bank is this is a pleasant time, this is a time for me to connect with Rick um, and have this little kind of filling up time, I come willingly with my face and I participate in that experience. And in the same breath, we're eliminating then the need for these kind of learned experiences of, you know, where's your nose, where's your eyes, where's your ears, because we're we're building all of that language, that rich, deep, meaningful language into the care situation. We're not having to manufacture that later on down the track. And so, so sorry, you know, carry on. No, no, no. The opportunities there in, in the everyday and the things we have to do anyway, it's up to us to infuse those mundane things or the jobs um, with meaning and um, connection. So the rhythm, so rituals with infants and toddlers, if I understand what you're saying correctly, is really the easiest one to infuse because we're already doing so many, so, so many rhythms and rituals with infants, but it's switching it from rushing through it to get it done to realizing that this is the ritual. The hand wash is the ritual. The the nappy change is the rich ritual. And when, and when Kimberly talked about ritual, she said these are moments of care, of, of relationship and connection where we fill the tank of our tamariki. It's what anchors them. It's what holds them. So um, for a team who are thinking, okay, yeah, we, we want to anchor our day with rhythms and rituals, um, where do they start? Start where you are. Um, take notice first of what's already happening. I really encourage people to, um, you know, I, I learned in the very early days right, when I started doing this, I gave a talk about sleep and I shared in this talk that um, we were doing uh, infant massage before we put our, our older toddlers to sleep because we noticed that they were not receiving as many of those care situations as the younger babies. And when that shift happens, there's almost this loss of, of connected time with the caregiver. And so we thought, you know, here's this way maybe we can introduce this meaningful time to connect before they go to sleep. Now, what happened was I had a whole lot of teachers and centers who went away and thought, okay, I need to, we need to do a massage. And then I had people contacting me and saying, how do we make the massage peaceful? It's so, you know, we're trying to get everybody done. And um, <laughs> and I realized, you know, okay, this is not about tacking on anything. You know, and I, I think I shared this example with you yesterday where I said, you know, I, I, I observed a, a, a group where they'd added a candle to their table because they'd seen someone else doing this as, as a ritual. We light the candle at our kai table. This signifies the beginning of the kai time. But this was for children who were about sort of 12 to 18 months old. And the children are wanting to touch the candle. The candle's getting bumped. The teacher's highly stressed by the candle's presence on the table. So what I'm suggesting is what if we, if we stopped where we are, if we paid attention to what is already happening, and then we took a deep breath and we made a decision to go deeper into what already exists before we choose to add anything. So I have to wash the hands after they eat. How can I wash the hand in a way that the hand receives my respect, my kindness, my gentle touch, my connectivity, that ends up filling this little tank before they head off into the play? How can I change the nappy in a slow, present, mindful way that means that by the time I lower this baby into bed, the little connection tank is, is topped up rather than tacking on the massage or adding a candle to the table. Start simple and, and really 
strengthen and deepen that stuff first is what I would say. So, so people might think, oh, we're going to add some rituals and then it just becomes a to-do list, another thing that they have to rush through and it just overwhelms them. Yeah. But understanding that it's already present in your setting, that mm. it's a more about becoming present in those key moments that you'll form those deep, deep relationships, right? Yeah. And for the older child, you know, it is a little more necessary for us to, to think a little more about those, how we're going to create those because they're not coming for the, the nappy change, for the bottle, for the maybe that they're wiping their own hands and they're dressing themselves. And so how do we provide opportunities for that similar um, connection and, and face-to-face time of, of attunement? Um, and so that's where the things that are a little bit more sort of constructed come in, like Kimberly's example of the, the – the foot spa and the, um, I mean, she used a practical example as well of the kai time. You know, that's a perfect opportunity. The children come to the kai table not just to have their bellies filled, but to have their hearts filled as well. And that's up to us. That's up to how we are in in that care situation as to whether or not they just leave with a full puku or whether they leave with a full love tank as well. Um, I want to just keep talking a little bit about the expansion and the contraction of our the rhythms of our day um you know you talked a little bit about saying like we don't want to keep children busy and you know just kind of fill their day with things which um i know that many of us think oh we've got to just find activities for children to do and then everything will be okay um i also have heard observations that when um, behavior are kind of like an, an issue or kind of out of out of control in classrooms that it's because the children are bored so I, I kind of am quite interested to know your perspective on um, how much do we need to create things to how much do we need to just hold space for them sure um, uh, the word boredom is an interesting one for me you know I I, I so I'm seeing this come up a lot at the moment because we're in this, we've got you know, two, two options here. We, we fill their time and we, we keep them busy and busy and busy or we provide space for them to, to do what they want. And um, something I read and have been reading quite a lot is that boredom is the best gift we could give the child because within the boredom they find creativity and play and hard work. And I, I disagree. I think boredom is... Um, it's, again, it's a bit of a low goal. <laughs> I think let's fill the child up. And let's fill the child up so that they have the capacity to go out from the immediate contact with the adult and to do the work that is a child's work, which is to play. Now, we can't throw them out the, the back door into an empty backyard and expect that that's going to happen or put them in an empty kind of centre environment and expect that, that will happen. So first of all, let's fill them up. Let's fill up that tank because my, my car takes 91 as its fuel source uh, and I won't get far if the tank's not full, but the child takes connection as the fuel source. So if I'm lacking in any way in terms of connection, I'm hungry for it and that's my sole focus. I cannot, it's a sort of like hierarchy of need stuff. I can't in, engage in the play and the work and the learning because those things, all one and the same, are results of an emotionally satisfied child. But they are also results of a learning environment. And so this is where we get this notion of the environment as third teacher, right? So we construct an environment that holds the child in play, holds the child in engagement. So I'm not saying no to activities, but what I'm suggesting is maybe provocation to play instead of adult-led activity right so the word provocation right we've got to provoke which means to invite or to call forth so when I set up a beautiful environment and it doesn't have to be you know really out there stuff I could just empty the cupboard right now in my kitchen and set up a little water play station on the deck with little measuring spoons and cups and vessels I'm setting the scene for, and this is something Kimberly said, you know, we set the scene 
believing that the, the child is, is a miraculous being and so we're expecting miracles to happen. That doesn't come from, from me, that comes from the child, but I must create an environment where that is made possible. So, you know, I'm putting the power of the play back in the hand of the child when I create an environment that is rich and engaging. And then I step back and I'm present because I must stay in relationship. The child must always be connected to the fuel source. But I'm not uh, leading this. I'm not the source of entertainment or activity. Um, the child does that work kind of on their own with our help a little bit because they are filled up by the connection first. Does that make sense? 100%. It, it reminds me a lot of the um, circle of security um, yes. model, right? Where the ch And I'd highly recommend anyone who's watching yeah. to go and search circle of security and um, learn as much as you can from, from that model, which is um, when the child needs you and, and shows... Um, signs and that that they want comfort and safety that you are there to hold them and but you don't over you don't kind of hold them tightly you allow them when they're filled up to go out and do the, what you said the child do the child's work and then but you're always there and present so that when they need you you are there but you're not overbearing and holding too tightly so that that when they move out when they're filled they go do their work and then you said um that expecting the child to uh, to to do miracles to you know do the amazing things it's for me that just resonates with the respectful practice where you said we have to re um view re see the child and to see the child as a miracle worker as a magic maker and have that like such a powerful image of the child is um is i think so powerful for them to live in as well yeah and, and, you know, Rick, I think that a child who has the capacity to be self-directed, to be um, engaging in interdependent play, I use the word interdependent there because there's no such thing as an independent baby. The baby is always in relationship with the adult in order to go out and do the work that they need to do. And so I think that I actually brought this little rubber band along because I think of it as the rubber band and, and you know, here's the adult on this side and here's the child. And for a baby, you know, the, the circle is tighter, that the, there's only so much stretch where I can be away from you and then I have to come back in. But it's always the child who pulls away, who stretches the rubber band, knowing that I can, I can pull away, I can go out and I can do the thing. But when, when the, the tension kind of gets a little bit tight on this, you start to see these little cracks and I'm getting a little bit thin and I need to come back. I need to, I need to dial it right back here, come back into the relationship. Maybe I need a cuddle. Maybe it's actually time for me to, to have a bottle and go to sleep for a bit. Um, or maybe I just need to check in, you know, and as an older child, I'm way out here. My rubber band's huge because my circle is bigger now. But and, and so all, all it looks like for me to reconnect with you is a glance across the playground. But for a baby, you know, it's a little bit more hands on than that. And so it, we, we kind of stay here. We stay really anchored. Um, and, and it's the child who kind of chooses where they, where they go out from there, knowing I can always come back when I have a need to be near, whether it be physical, emotional, mental or all those things at the same time, which it usually is. That's such a beautiful um thing to keep in our hearts as we practice with infants and, and toddlers because um, if we're holding that that notion that we're the we're the anchor and the, and they are pulling out and, and looking to come back then um, it will really dynamically change the way that we are within a group setting because uh, what what we see often is is kind of like something put out for babies and then we're off busy doing other things and we've almost and unless the child cries, unless the baby cries we we've almost lost connection with that child yeah. because we're checking the charts and heating yeah. the bottles all things that we need to do right which i know many infant teachers are like yes and that's exactly it's all the burden all the things that we have to do so um how do we balance those kind of to do's in a classroom with actually holding the child in relationship mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think that it's not, I'm not saying for a moment that we need to sit and be present and, and gazing at the child every moment of the day. <laughs> um, but being mindful of our movements, being mindful of, of the busyness, um, what, my, what is my body language when I'm moving around and doing all of those things? How do I bring you into that as the child? So if I'm present to you in your play, and it's now time for me to go and prepare the meal or prepare the bottles. Um, do I get up and leave and wait for you to have a response to that before I say, oh, I'm only going to make the bottles, I'll be back. Or do I say, you know, you're busy, you're playing, and I wait for a little moment where maybe you, you look towards me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to capture that. I'm going to say, oh, wow, would you look at that? It's almost time for us to have our lunch. I'm going to go in the kitchen now and prepare that kai. You can stay here in the sandpit, um, or you could come and be with me if you want to. Chances are, this child, if this is their common experience, they're going to go, okay, well, yeah, let me know when you're ready. <laughs> um, because this is, you know, we, we've, it's hugely built on trust, right? And so if I, if I always bring you into my decisions, I'm just going to go in here and check on your friends in the sleep room. Um, I'll, I'll come right back. Or... Um, I just, I'm going to head to the bathroom and then I'll come back into the room. When I always bring you into those decisions, you have the sense of trust in me because I've never snuck away without your knowledge. I've never disappeared without you knowing what's happening first. And so you can relax into your work knowing that, yeah, I'll come and go and I'll move around the environment, but there's no surprises here. There is never any surprises in what happens. You are just as much of a partner. You know, if we were colleagues in the room, Rick, I wouldn't just go to the bathroom without telling you because I'm going to leave you with however many children, right? So let's give our children that same level of partnership and courtesy that there's no surprises for them either within the environment. And I think that's not an instantaneous fix, but over time it breeds this culture of trust. Um, which eventually leads to children being pretty settled. Brilliant, brilliant. I want to give some time. We've got a few few minutes left to um, have our audience ask some questions. So if you've got some questions for Helen, please just go to our comment section. And um, some people have been messaging in the question. That's not the easiest way to do it. So just leave a comment um, on this broadcast. And if you've got a question, please. Um, we will make some time to answer that. So I'm kind of getting quite a nice um, visual image of what a good um, uh, learning space could look like. We, we're holding children in rituals. So we're using the rhythms and routines as moments of connection, and that's helping form like a, a structure and a safety for the child to the predictability, to know what's coming, to know what's coming, uh, going forward. And that's where their emotional tank is being filled up and then we're also um, using the environment to create interesting uh, provocations for exploration where uh, when when they are ready to go explore and to um, be the scientists that they're innately born to be there are things which they can do experiments with and then uh, maybe there's a little bit of a confrontation and they have a good tussle and they try and sort it out with themselves but one of the children are looking for just some safety again, but and you are there. You're not overbearing and trying to like solve it for them, but they you're there so that they can come back to you and 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 that kind of rhythm through the day sets us up to to match the biological needs of the child. Absolutely. Yeah. Um okay. I've got some questions coming through. So let's see what, what we can do. Um What would you say uh, respectful care looks like for teachers as adults? Um, so I think the question is, what does it look like with each other as teammates? Um, yeah, so it can be reflected in practice with children as well. Yeah. Uh, so I actually, I was thinking about this uh, last night and I think the thing that really came to mind was respect is not something Respect is not something we do, it's it's a part of who we are. 
And so just we've talked a lot this morning about trusting the child and believing that the child has the capacity and the ability to be, you know, the pilot of their learning journey. And what's what's really important is that we have trust in one another as well. So, you know, I always say to, to teams, you know, it's important to ask the question, do I do I have so I ask this question first, I say, do I have the basic trust of my leadership and my colleagues? And when I say that, when I ask that question, everyone's kind of like, yeah, well, do I, you know? And, and then my next question is, do you offer basic trust to your leadership, to your colleagues? And it's a little bit harder to um, to kind of go there because it's easy to say what I'm not giving. It's harder to to look at maybe what I'm what I'm not doing myself. So respect begins with us. Respect begins with how we are with, with ourselves and with one another. Uh, and so I think again, it's it's similar stuff. It's the language we use with one another. It's it's seeking to respond in a way that is maybe curious about the other person's perspective. Um, that is taking into consideration where they are, meeting them where they are, and seeing them through new eyes as well. So it's easy to to lay blame and Tanya touched on this a lot. It's easy to look at the other and what they're not doing or what they do wrong. Um, but we are not trapped in our default settings. We get to choose um, our responses. And this is a muscle that needs to be exercised to be made stronger. You know, instead of thinking, oh, you know, she was meant to fold all of the um, flannels and she, di she didn't. And so now it's on me. And I'm always having to pick up the slack. Um, what if I reframe that and I kind of went, you know, what is what is preventing her from from having the space to do that? And maybe I could have a conversation there. Um, so it's it's very similar in terms of how we respect the child is is first of all how we respect ourselves, and then how we respect the others and our in our team and, and parents and families and leadership. Um, yeah, absolutely. The the trust one is very interesting so many people and i've said this before are saying hey trust needs to be earned and that's like our default you you better be good enough for me that's what we're saying and actually when we think about trust trust is actually <laughs> this might be different to what people look at it as well but this is how i've started to see it trust is actually driven by fear because we're, we're essentially saying can i trust you so that you're not going to hurt me like can i give you my heart can i open up to you so that you don't hurt me so yeah. it's almost like the boundaries are, are drawn by the fears that we have that someone else is going to hurt us. And often um, when we put that fear on someone, we will look for the things that they're doing that, that could kind of like um, show us that, yeah, that they're definitely going to hurt you. You better be careful. Where if we change our heart posture towards I'm going to supply trust to you, i.e. I'm going to believe the best in you. I'm going to see the gold in you and I'm going to believe that you are going to actually have my heart at, as the best interest. Then we're going to start looking for evidence to confirm our bias again. And so I'm going to start seeing the fact that you've actually come in this morning and cleaned the tables and put um, something nice like that smells good in the classroom because you actually care for me as an adult. So we start to see the things that they are doing instead of like looking for evidence of the things that they're not doing. So I'd, yeah. I like to say like trust, Trust is supplied, it's not earned in the first instance. And then um, as a relationship grows, that changes a little bit. But that's a good start for someone to to think about that. It's like, how can you supply trust? Um, okay, just going to the next question. There's a few that's come in. Um, this is quite, quite good. How can we get everyone on our team on the same page with regards to circle of security and building that relationship and connection? Mm. Um, Sierra, it's a big one. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I, I want to say, first of all, actually, that this is not destination based. So we have this mindset sometimes that we're aiming to achieve something and then we'll be done. And this is called practice for a reason. We're not, we're not reaching a destination and an arrival point where we no longer have any hard work or struggle or, or you know, um, Dis disconnection so I would start with getting really clear on where you are 
because, and I think this is something that I'm sort of paraphrasing Tanya now, um, we can't, and I say this as well, we can't aim to do something in a new way um, until we first understand where we are because we need to have a really solid um, grasp of, of what things currently look like before we can see what we might need to tweak and change. So um, self-review is super helpful there, some, some conversations. You know, I was speaking to a team the other day and I said, she said, oh, we're not, we're not using this time to... Um, to connect we're, we're not I don't, we don't think we're really utilizing it and I said can you pick up the phone and call maybe every other day this week call a colleague and say you know I wondered if you could email me some of your learning stories I'd love to read what's going on for your group um, how can you see what you know what the other people in your team have as their priorities and their perspectives um, so start there with who we are and what we currently know um, then we can start to work towards a common understanding. And the goal is, I guess, not that everyone be on the same page, but that everybody at least be reading the same book. And um, we're all going to be different. We're all going to have our, and that's important and a good thing. Um, but we do need to be kind of aboard the same walker, heading in the same direction. Um, and and, and yeah. that can really come from what we know we can only practice based on what we know as well we have a toolbox that we draw on um and if we're not in alignment there then we're kind of all islands within the team so there's a lot there but i think first of all it would be starting with really identifying where you are and what's currently happening that's good yeah i think we we tend to carry on as we've always carried on as our parents have shown us as as we've always until there's a crisis or an intervention right and so uh sometimes just looking uh, watching this hour-long broadcast is the intervention that helps some of your team members realize and understand that oh there's another way of practicing so i'm a big advocate of of sitting down with with your team and exposing yourself to good practice and good good um, professional development together because it just forms a really good framework for uh, you to start conversations about uh, where are people at in relation to what what was said so um definitely go see helen uh, go to her website um she does i know you do a lot of um, in center pd and and workshops so it's a good start um Last question, any advice for when we return to our setting and the children's emotions? Mm, Kelsey, this is a good one. I think, um, you know, I, I'm seeing a lot happening at the moment in terms of um, centres doing some some really cool things. You know, we've, we're doing uh, online story reading times and, and it's a little bit harder when we're looking at infants and toddlers to keep those connections going. So I was thinking about this um, the other day and I thought, you know, what if maybe instead of aiming to stay connected to the child at the moment, especially our younger ones, we stayed connected to the family. And when we return, say it's the first day back, and emotions are running high for everybody. It's been a while and we're out of practice. And I'm taking this child to bed for the first time today and I'm about to change their nappy. And I can say, you know what, I was chatting to a dad uh on on wednesday and he was telling me that you guys have been really into making banana bread at the moment um we actually have some for morning tea today because i know you love it so much to me that's sort of like me walking into your house and the minute i walk in the door you've got the jug on and you're making the cup of tea the way i like it you know how good does it feel to know that i'm knowing so what can we do to stay connected to what the child is currently experiencing so that when they do return, um, I can connect to, to that with you and, and, and as a result of that, you feel known. And then there's going to be this, this aspect that is a little beyond our control where they are going to be unsettled and, and we are going to have children who are, who are quite upset and parents as well um, who, you know, have been – been finding this whole thing hard and there's a lot of emotions there and I think it's it's just showing up it's a holding space for that it's saying gosh you're really going to miss mum today or it's so hard when dad leaves and, and it makes you feel really upset I'm here with you I see that and the ability to hold space for those big feelings 
without kind of um, entering into to chaos ourselves. You know, I think we anticipate almost it's going to be stressful and I, how, oh, it's going to be a bad day. And when we go in with that mindset, of course it will be. Um, but mm-hmm. when we can approach it with this kind of, whew, okay, there's some big feelings going on and powerful stuff surging around the room, I'm going to I'm gonna center myself so that I can hold space for these, these big emotions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Helen, the wisdom that you've shared and um, what you've um, given us today is going to make a significant difference in all our settings. So thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, do you have a website that people can go check out your work? What's the what's the easiest way to get connected to you? Um, either through my Facebook page or my website. So the Facebook page is Helen Armstrong Early Childhood Consultant, uh, and my website is just HelenArmstrong.co.nz. Um, and I did say to a couple of people as well. I'll go back through um, some of the unanswered questions on 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 the feed here, and and I'm happy to chat to people afterwards as well. So, and always happy for people to send me a message or an email and uh, we can chat. Fantastic. And um, for everyone out there, uh, thank you so much for tuning in and and connecting with us. This has been a really special time for us all. If you want the um, PD certificates, remember you can go to this address here, consciouscollective.talentlms.com forward slash catalog. Um, it's all 10 of the webinars that we're doing. You can get the certificates for only 10 bucks. We're also uploading, um, some people have just asked for transcripts. We figured out how to do that on the weekend because that's just what we like to do. So transcripts of all the interviews will be on there. We're also going to upload all the videos and a ton more stuff. So it'd be a great resource to keep connected. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Kaki Te, have another wonderful day out in the sunshine.